last 30 years, the forces of autocracy have been The Russian army is committing barbaric actions. Welcome to our next episode on understanding the war in Ukraine. This time we're going to talk about economics and finance and therefore I needed some help. So we're going to do a question and answer session with uh, Professor George Papa Constantinou here at the School of Transnational Governance. He's also the former uh, finance minister of Greece, uh, has worked for the OECD. The other episodes that we're going to discuss on a Q&A basis are going to be on energy and international law. So today, welcome, George. Really nice to see you. Good to be here. Let's begin uh, with the first question of the big picture. You've had experience in three major crises. Uh, the first one was the financial crisis and the euro crisis. The second one was COVID. And the third one is now the war. How would you compare and contrast these three? They must be quite different, right? Three very different type of crises. The first one, the, the global financial crisis and the eurozone crisis that followed it, is, in a, is, is a crisis that comes from within the financial system. It's a crisis aside from the financial sector, the banking sector, and in the case of the eurozone crisis, of course, has uh, Greece as the trigger and Greece's uh, fiscal uh, problems as the trigger. Even though we read it as a fiscal uh, problem, the Eurozone crisis was more a banking and financial issue. Then you have the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis comes from outside. It's not uh, an economic crisis. It's a health crisis. But, of course, it has substantive, substantial economic implications. Economists like to say it was a, a crisis that hit the demand side as well as the supply side because we had complete disruptions, uh, of course, lockdowns and implications on that were severe on our economies and also on the fiscal position of countries. And now we have a war. And of course, uh, a war is, again, a completely different type of crisis. And it's interesting to see its economic implications by looking at the various protagonists. So Russia, the aggressor, uh, Ukraine that suffers the war, uh, of course, implications for the EU and the world as such. Okay, let's now move on to the ramifications on Russia, because of course a lot of people talk about sanctions, financial implications. Um, what's the hit going to be on the Russian economy? Okay, so the, the first of all, the first of course uh, uh, cost, economic cost to Russia is the war itself, and uh, figures are very hard to come by, of course. But uh, many people seem to to think that the cost of the war to Russia is about a billion a day, uh, uh, so to speak, perhaps a bit less than that. But it, obviously, this is a very significant cost. But of course, the bigger, the bigger cost to the Russian economy comes from the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia to, and the reasons for the sanctions are clearly to, to limit the ability of Russia to finance the war and to uh, uh, impose economic and social uh, conditions and bans on the elite that kind of supported and uh, generated the war. So the economic sanctions come in different uh, categories. We have the financial sanctions, so cutting off uh, Russian banks from the uh, swift messaging uh, international network for financial transactions. We have the major uh, uh, decision to freeze the assets of the Russian Central Bank abroad, that's uh, unprecedented, it's huge. Uh, every central bank keeps an, uh, part of its assets in different currencies abroad, and we have basically frozen about half of the 600 billion of Russian assets. Then uh, there are uh, sanctions in transport. Uh, we have banned uh, uh, air transport to and from Russia, uh, access to ports, road haulage. There are defense uh, bans, uh, equipment, of course, going to Russia. We're not going to send military equipment to a country that is the aggressor. And last but not least are the, uh, in addition to some commodity uh, uh, sanctions, there are the sanctions on energy, uh, where we have the coal sanctions that have happened, the oil sanctions, which the EU has not gotten there yet, and potentially the, ga the gas sanctions. So, all of these sanctions have, uh, have had a pretty significant impact on Russia. In the beginning of the sanctions, we saw that as the financial sanctions hit, the ruble completely collapsed. Um, uh, you had a financial panic, a lot of people were drawing money from the banks, the central bank had to step in, put capital controls, 
uh, and this was also complemented, of course, by the, the non-official sanctions, which is a number of foreign companies moving out of Russia and, and restricting their operations or, or abandoning the country altogether. But, and there's a big but here, uh, which is that even though initially we thought, and some of the initial projections were saying that Russia will see its GDP drop by about 15%, we have seen, st seen some stabilization and some ability of the Russian economy to withstand the shock. Remember, Russia is a big economy. Mm -hmm. It produces a lot of what it needs internally. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the main problem that we're having here is that we are funding this war because every month, we are, every day, we are providing Russia about one billion of foreign exchange through our purchases of oil and gas. And the irony is that since the beginning of the war, actually these revenues have almost doubled. So Russia, since the beginning of the war, has received over 60 billion euro in revenues from the EU in, uh, for uh, buying oil and gas. So on the one hand, we've imposed sanctions. On the other hand, uh, we are funding the war indirectly through our energy purchases. And this is why you have seen, for example, the ruble stabilize to where it was before the start of the war. This is why the 15% drop in GDP seems now overly pessimistic. It will be less than that. Now, this does not mean that in the long run, Russia will not be seriously economic hit. Uh, even if it, it manages to withstand the short run, it is the war and the sanctions are taking Russia back decades. It is becoming cut off. Uh, from the world economic and financial system, and it will incur a very serious economic cost. But in the short term, are we actually, through the sanctions, managing to stop the ability of Russia to finance the war? Not quite. So basically, we're looking at the back and forth and time lag in the sense that we're funding the war with one billion uh, a day. They're losing one billion a day. Uh, and a lot of it is related to the price of energy and the price of gas. So that's why when we sort of try to work in this world of sanctions, we really have to be careful. Just a final reminder to everyone that uh, the Russian economy is pretty much roughly used to be about 2% of the world GDP, which is somewhere between the Netherlands and, and Spain. Uh, let's move to Ukraine then, because of course, you know, the, the impact on the Ukraine economy is huge, but that is I assume, being subsidized in a completely different way. And uh, what would you look as an economist to, at Ukraine? What's going on there? Well, in addition to the, of course, enormous uh, human toll that uh, Ukraine is uh, suffering at the moment, there is uh, a, an equally uh, large, huge economic uh, toll. Um, in a war, basic infrastructure is completely destroyed. Production stops. Uh, in a war that mobilizes a large part of the adult population to fight uh, labor supply for production is not there. Add to that the emigration, not of necessarily of men, but of, of, of women in the prime age, which further reduces labor supply. And add on top of that the fact that you have uh, two of the main ports of the, of the Ukraine. So you have Odessa and Mariupol. Uh, that are, have been captured uh, by uh, the Russian army. Mariupol has been obliterated. Uh, through those two ports, 50% of total exports of Ukraine were going out, and 90% of its wheat exports were going through those two, two ports. Now, Ukraine has actually prohibited exports of wheat uh, because it wants to feed its own population. It that wants to have food security before it exports. But all this together, uh, means, uh, it translates in what the World Bank estimated just a few days ago as a potential collapse of Ukrainian GDP of between 40 and 50 percent this year. It is absolutely massive. Yeah. Now, which means that we need to respond and, and Ukraine urgently needs financial help. We are helping Ukraine through uh, defense, uh, but f Ukraine also needs financial help to uh, help its uh, population sustain itself in an environment where there's no production. Think, you know, think, make an analogy to COVID. In mm. COVID, uh, where we had the complete collapse of economic activity for, for a few months, uh, the, the European states and beyond uh, massively spent to, you know, to allow people to uh, fulfill their obligations, to, to be able to, to, to sustain themselves. 
double that or triple that for this particular case. And where are they getting the money from? Well, at the moment, they're not. The, mm. At the moment, there is not much financial help of that type. Financial help is mostly on the defense side, less on the financial. They're talking to the IMF. Uh, they're talking to, to European governments. This is the next stage. It is an urgent uh, short-term financial help. And of course, when the war ends, uh, the absolutely massive restructuring effort that will be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, where, of course, the West will have to have uh, uh, both private and public sectors would have a major role in financing. We need a new Marshall Plan, I guess. Absolutely. This is exactly the parallel you need here. Okay, let's move to the European economy next, because uh, as all of us know, um, war, when it drags on, uh, at some stage the focus starts to go elsewhere. We've talked about in this series previously, we start looking at inflation, the price of food, uh, the price of energy. We also actually start looking at the asylum crisis and the cost of that. So what are the implications for the European economy at the moment? What are your sort of predictions? Where are we going with this? Well, there's an old uh, uh, lesson from the economic history of sanctions, which says that when you impose sanctions, you know they bite when also the nations imposing them feel mm. the economic cost. So sanctions are beginning to bite because we're also feeling the costs. Yeah. Now, of course, nothing like uh, uh, as the cost in Russia or, or in Ukraine, of course. Uh, but the European economy is suffering as a result of the war. There's a direct cost. Remember that the number of neighboring states to the Ukraine have a huge influx of refugees. Uh, there's a question, there's a, there's a significant economic cost attached to that. There's a direct economic cost of the defense expenditures as we are helping Ukraine face the aggressor. And then there's the broader economic costs, the main of which come through energy and food prices. So um, the cost of energy was already increasing before the war. Uh, we were coming out of COVID. Uh, latent sort of sleeping activity and demand that was not realized suddenly shot up. Supply was not there yet, so you had an imbalance within supply and demand. Demand was rising much faster, so prices of uh, oil and gas were going up even before. But now we're in the middle of a massive supply shock to the European economy through the price of energy. And this will filter already in food prices. Mm. People are beginning to feel it in their pocket. They're beginning to feel it in uh, their monthly bills. They are feeling it when they go to the supermarket. Inflation is, for the first time in many, many years, uh, uh, over 6%. Uh, for, a, for a moment there, it went even higher. Uh, the prediction is that it will be 6% for the year. Is that including energy prices? That's including energy yeah. prices. It went to roughly 10% at some point, but for the whole year, uh, the estimate is that it will be above 6% uh, before it sort of lands down to roughly 3% next year. The European economy as a whole uh, will lose a couple of percentage points of growth compared to what we were projecting uh, before uh, growth. But here's where the problem is. Um, we are coming out of COVID and entered this war. So from a policy perspective, in terms of policy levers, you're in a much worse situation than you were before. The fiscal space in, uh, in, in uh, individual uh, European economies to be able to counteract and shelter, uh, cushion the cost of energy for households and businesses uh, is limited compared to where it was because we spent massively, rightly so, during COVID to be able to get our economies going again. And if you look on the monetary side, the ECB has a very tough, is in a very tough spot. Um, inflation is rampant, so its mandate is to control prices and therefore it's got to raise interest rates. Um, but we're facing a big supply shocks uh, so in those situations, monetary policy is not terribly effective in that. And it doesn't want to raise interest rates, interest rates, not prices, excuse me, interest rates too much, because if it does so, it will crash the European economy. So it, we're in a very tough policy situation uh, against a, a shock, which is a classic supply shock. So as a political scientist, tell me if I get this right. We have inflation. We have low growth, which I guess means stagflation. On top of that, we will probably increasing interest rates. 
and then on top of that we have very limited fiscal space. So one could say that things are not looking very good economically, are they? I think that's about right. Uh, and of course the big question, uh, add to that, when economists make projections, you know, they, they, they cite two things, they cite uncertainties and risks. Mm. Well, you know, uncertainty is huge, yeah. and the uncertainty is not economic, it's non-economic, we just don't know when the war will finish, yeah. and, and a lot will depend on that. And risks, and the risks are all on the upside. So um, it is, you know, we may have a softer landing if the war ends quickly, uh, if, uh, if somehow energy costs abate, uh, the rises abate a little bit. Uh, but the more realistic scenario is for this to be a more protracted crisis mm -hmm. and for the impact on growth to be more severe than we're looking at. Yeah. You know what, George, I think it's sometimes quite nice to be a professor rather than a minister at this stage. I think Absolutely. You know, this it, is, it would be a bit a of a hot tough, house. It's a very it's, tough, it's a very sport, tough spot, policy. yeah. Okay, let's go to the final question, because of course we're quite Eurocentric in the way in which we look at this war, for understandable reasons, but it will have ramifications on the global economy, financial markets, trade. How do you see this? Okay, there's, there's a number of elements that we need to take into account here. And, and, uh, and we need to start from one very important element, which is the rising energy prices uh, together with the problems in exporting uh, wheat uh, are uh, very likely uh, going to lead to uh, serious shortages of food in developing nations. I'll give you just one example. Somalia imports 100% of its wheat from two countries, Russia and Ukraine. Um, that means that with Ukraine having uh, not exporting any wheat and with Russia not being willing or uh, being embargoed on certain aspects of exporting wheat, this will lead to huge prices. The UN is already very worried and has come out publicly uh, saying uh, we are facing the possibility of uh, famine in a number of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of countries in Africa have sounded the alarm. So here's a, a first huge repercussion because it's clear that the war impacts differently around the world, uh, just like it, it impacts differently in Europe and sort of the, the weaker households and the, the countries that geographically close to Ukraine hit most. Mm -hmm. Similarly, it has a bigger impact in weaker countries. So. Um, Let's start from that, which is the, the urgent issue that, that needs to be addressed. Then if you look at that, the broader picture, I think there's two things to keep in mind. The first is that you have a disruption of, of value chains, you have disruption of, of trade, you have confidence having collapsed and we don't know when it will come back, and you have financial systems which are disrupted because of all this. Now all this, uh, um, the, the, the World Bank has kind of uh, come with a, a, a scenario of growth that clips world growth by about between one and one and a half percent. It could be more, we don't know. And there is a final element which I think we, we need to include in our discussion. And that is what this will mean for global economic governance as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Because what we've seen is that the West has rightly so used it's leverage over currencies, the dollar, and to a lesser extent the euro, to be able to exert pressure of mm -hmm. Russia. But by doing so, it has polarized at the same time uh, the world. Uh, there you have on the one hand, uh, in purely in economic terms, uh, the, uh, the EU together with the US and a number of other countries. And on the other hand, you have of course Russia, with China somewhere in between, and India. Now, as you move forward, there is a big question about what this weaponization of the financial instruments of globalization will mean for globalization itself. Are we seeing a retreat? And not only in terms of financial trade flows, but then if you go beyond and think of other areas, next time we sit around and discuss climate, for example, or global uh, new health uh, uh, strategy, are we going to be able to be on the same table in the same wavelength? This is a necessary step for us to, to use those tools to be able to stop what is a, a, an aggressive uh, uh, war, uh, but it will have longer term implications for globalization itself. Great. Thank you very much, uh, George. And uh, to all of you, I don't know about you, but I, I learned a lot about the economic and financial implications uh, of this war, comparing it to previous crises, the Euro crisis, COVID, and now the war.
and then looking at things through the lens of Ukraine, Russia, Europe and the rest of the world. The nice thing with talking with George, of course, is that both of us have our PhD from the London School of Economics. Both of us suffered through the Euro crisis uh, in governments, probably on the opposite side of the fence. There'll be more in the pipeline in this lecture series. Please follow us on YouTube. Next time around, we'll be talking about things such as energy, uh, international law, uh, climate, and probably international relations, Europe and democracy as well. See you soon. Over the last 30 years, the forces of democracy have been The Russian army is committing barbaric action.